Welcome to another episode of Map Your Money. I'm one of your hosts, Ara Sharani, Wealth Advisor and Certified Financial Planner here at BGA Wealth. I am joined by Jeff Cohn, our Chief Investment Officer and CFA Charter Holder here at Beam and BGA Wealth. Uh, great to have you, Jeff. How's it going? Hey, man, no complaints. It's warming up in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, getting a little sweaty, but that means my trip to Oklahoma and Eufaula Lake is coming up, so I'm very excited. Oh, yeah. My golden doodle got trimmed today as well, so now he can finally enjoy the warmer weather. Uh, everything is going great, dude. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well. Excited for, for this episode. Have some, some really interesting topics lined up. Uh, going to be recapping what we've seen in the market and the economy this year, uh, almost halfway through the year. But before we jump into to all of that fun stuff, I um, want to start with an icebreaker like we usually do. And I just got to talk about this news story because it, it just makes me laugh so, so much. Um, Jeff, have you seen the movie Her? It's with Her. Joaquin no, Phoenix the, and Scarlett Johansson. I, I remember who plays, like the... Uh... The previews, but I never saw it. Yeah, yeah. So basically, the whole Does premise he, like, fall of the in movie. Love with, like, an AI he he falls like in that? love with an AI. I think it's like a 2011 movie. So it's like way before that was like really a thing. Siri was just kind of getting introduced. Uh, but this is like a super advanced AI. And the voice who played the AI was Scarlett Johansson's voice. Um, so fast forward to today. Uh, or last week, OpenAI, uh, who makes ChatGPT, they released their new model of ChatGPT, their 4.0. Uh, and the big feature was that you could talk to the AI uh, and talk to the ChatGPT. So they have a couple different voice options, but the main voice um, sounds exactly like Scarlett Johansson. Uh, and so um, it came out that nine okay, months I've ago. I've definitely heard about this. I, it's been yeah, talked about. Yeah, yeah. It came out nine months ago that Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, the creators of ChatGPT, asked Scarlett Johansson for permission to use her voice. And she said no. Um, but they went ahead and basically used it anyway. Apparently, they got a voice actor who found like sounded exactly the same. Um, obviously, Scarlett Johansson's not happy with this, so she sued them. I have the chat GPT and like they took that voice away. Um, but I just think, and then the icing on the cake was that after it released, Sam Altman tweeted just her. Um, and I was like, he's just bragging <laughs> at this point. Yeah. Um, I just think hey, it's is, a hilarious Is it really story, like imitating yeah. or mimicking if they're using a voice actor? Like that's, I think that's, that's really their like legal replicating argument. or stealing yeah. her, her uh, likeness, right? Like that would be the issue. Yeah, but like they kind of are. I don't know. It, that's definitely too much in the le legal weeds for me. But it's I just implied, think it's hilarious. Right? So I was gonna say like this is this is interesting with AI and like how they can imitate voices. And obviously we've seen how they can do this with videos too. But you know yeah. I'm still on my mom's phone plan and I like Venmo her for that every month. And I recently <laughs> upgraded to the new iPhone. And when I did, I had to like call my mom and they, she had to like confirm it. You know with like the account people. And so I just call her. I'm like, hey mom, it's Jeff. Like you know, approve this for the Verizon guy. Here you go. And she just like approved it, sure. no questions asked. And I was like, hey, by the way, in the future, we need to have a security question because it's going to be easy to yeah. imitate my voice. And like, I'm sorry, mom, I know you love me, but you won't know the difference, you know? And I think, for I think sure. maybe that's a good example of even though AI is going to be extremely innovative and it's going to be beneficial in a lot of parts of the economy, it can also be used um, and, and, and morally... <laughs> you know, negative ways, right? And and I think there there needs to be some sort of ethics around that. And what's interesting is ChatGPT oh, yeah. apparently was very tuned into that. Um, but I now, now maybe they're going another way. Interesting. Yeah, no, the fraud around AI is continuingly to, to be a very scary aspect of this progression of technology. Um, but I think it's something that we need to be aware of and, and looking at and, uh, Another main point is hopefully you don't fall in love with, with your AI, like apparently ChatGPT wants you to. So um, They have AI but, and they have dolls that are getting more and more realistic. I don't know if I like where this is yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. This is no, getting I've weird. I've seen too, too many of these movies that, that go south. But um, without further ado, we'll, we'll jump into to the better stuff about the, the market and economy. Uh, but but let's let's get into it. Hello, and welcome to Map Your Money, a finance-focused podcast. 
We exist to simplify the lives of our clients and listeners and help individuals create the roadmap for their financial future. Content is for educational purposes only. Consult a financial advisor or conduct your own due diligence of investing. Calls are pre-screened and the content was pre-recorded. All right, so we are almost halfway through the year. Feels like this year has flown by. It's we're recording here on May twenty third, um, and uh, gonna get this out before the end of May. But I guess Jeff, just recap us on on what we've seen in the markets and economy uh, so far this year. Um, where we're at? Sure. Hey, before we do that, I don't know if you saw last night. There was this survey released asking people okay. what they thought of the current economy, right? And, and this has been an issue for a while where we're seeing consumer confidence surveys that show a consumer that's that's not confident, that's saying the economy is not treating them well, but at the same time, that same consumer is going out and buying durable goods, recreational goods and services, discretionary items, right? Indicating that they actually do have confidence, right? So, so listen to the stats of the survey, dude. This is mind-blowing to me. 55% of people polled believe the economy is shrinking and 56% think the U.S. is experiencing a recession. 49% believe the S&P 500 is down this year (laughs) and 49%. So, I mean, I don't know what those people own. 49% also believe that the unemployment rate is at a 50 year high. Oh my gosh. 50 year (laughs) high. Okay, That's well, crazy. what is going on? Are, do people not yeah. own Google? I, I'm just like so confused because, you know, we're, we're going to talk about the unemployment rate and, and the stock market. I know you asked about that. We'll get to it. But it's at a 50-year low, basically, you know? And and like if, if you ignore like the previous few months where it was like a few ticks lower, right? And and the stock market is is not down. It, you know, it's uh, like these kind of things I think are – are very shocking to me. And I think it, 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 it is consistent with a lot of the things that we've been seeing from the consumer saying that, wow, like they're, they're really not feeling some of the economic strength um, that, that we're showing. But anyway, I, I just, I don't know if you saw yeah. that, but I wanted to bring that up. Very strange. What, what are your thoughts? No, your I had thoughts? It, I hadn't seen that. That's, that's super interesting. And I always kind of question who, who is being surveyed in these surveys. Um, but I, I definitely think the moral of that, is always going to ring true. I think the place where most people are getting information in terms of what's happening with their money, what's happening with the economy is always going to be kind of negative leaning because all of it's coming from these different news sources, different outlets that at the end of the day, they're a business and they have to kind of get eyeballs on the screen and stay on the screen so they can sell ad revenue. And the way they do that the best is by selling fear. Uh, And so I'd honestly be really curious to see like what that survey has looked like in different time periods, how healthy they think the economy is. I bet it's never like there's never a period where they're like, oh, it's, the economy is doing great. From reality? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, there's never really a point, I think, if you're just looking back through time and say you're always surveying people and say, okay, how do you think the economy is? How do you think unemployment is? I don't really think there'd be a point that I can point to, especially if they don't think right now is that they're like, things are healthy. It's a, the economy is good. Um, but I think that's one of the morals we're about to talk about right now is that the economy has been extremely, extremely healthy. All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was interesting. Arish, we'll, we'll see if, if consumers, you know, maybe learn how to, how to Google or maybe some media companies will, will give some accurate information or, or we'll see what happens. But anyway, Hey, you asked me how, uh, the markets are doing this year. So let, let me give you a quick recap. So, you know, these numbers are as of, uh, the close on May 17th. Uh, but when you look at the S and P 500, not down this year, it's actually up 11.8%. The NASDAQ up 11.5%. Small cap stocks, up only 4% and the Dow Jones up a little under 7%. Uh, so, you know, still a, a good continuation of, of strong returns. The S&P 500 is now up almost 30% in the last year and has averaged 10% a year over the last three years. So overall, this is, you know, pretty good returns here. Bonds 
we are down a little bit to start the year because rates are a little higher as the market is, has had to kind of decrease their their expectations for the number of, of Fed cuts. Uh, but we've also had some, some other things doing pretty well in the markets. Metals are doing extremely well. Metals like steel and copper and gold uh, are, are hitting new highs. Uh, utilities have also done really well on, on kind of the, the pickup in the trade of the increased power consumption and demand that some data centers and some AI models uh, are, are going to be using. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, short duration bonds and, and high yield continue also to do well in an environment that is, has been pretty strong, has been resilient, and, um, you know, an environment where rates have gone up a little bit, which is when short duration outperforms. Um, and, you know, overall, I think if, if you think about the economy and some economic data that we're getting, Inflation has come in a little hotter than expected, you know, to start the year. Um, you know, we've seen some Fed officials come out and say, you know, we we have not seen further progress in, in hitting our inflation target, right? So kind of admitting that there's been some progress. We went from nine to three, but haven't really seen much since then. But a lot of that rhetoric has been about the Fed more delaying rate cuts rather than canceling rate cuts or, or really triggering uh, rate hikes, right? So overall, you know, the, the economy keeps chugging along, you know, and, and I think we, we had that little bit, you know, 5% pullback in April on those inflation scares and, and rates going up a bit. But, um, you know, we, we went into to May and we got all of those losses back plus some and, you know, NVIDIA just reported earnings and, and they were really good. So, you know, hey, we're still hitting new all time highs. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I want to want to kind of circle back to that point about inflation. And I know you mentioned it's been a little bit hotter than expected, but I, I want to kind of caveat that or, or add some more context there. Inflation's actually been fairly low compared to what we've seen um, or what we saw, especially in 2021 going into 2022, um, when we were really hitting those really high inflation numbers. Um, and so inflation has been in this 3% range uh, for the last year now. So for the last year of Prince, it's been in this three to four percent range, not not going over four percent, not going under three percent, uh, and the Fed's target there with with uh, inflation is two percent. So we're still a little ways away from that, um, and and they definitely want us to get us there at at some point. But kind of coming into this year, even part of last year, uh, it was really expected that with the Federal Reserve coming in and hiking these interest rates up to moderate inflation, that something in the economy was going to break. We were going to see unemployment spike. Uh, something was going to go wrong. And then this would have to kind of force the, the Fed's hand. They would then have to bring interest rates down. Uh, and if you've noticed kind of across the board, interest rates have stayed high. Uh, and you, you mentioned kind of how they, they've edged up here recently. Uh, but one of the reasons is because the economy has been so strong. We, we talked about that survey there at the, the top and mentioned how actually strong the economy truly is. And it's probably not something that the everyday person or, or investor might realize, but but the economy has been doing really well. And it's been the reason for um, interest rates staying high at, at, at this point. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, if you look at, think about like what the economy is, right? Like how do we measure the economy? We measure it based on spending or we measure it based on income. And those are really just two sides of the same coin, right? Spending that I do is, is income for someone else. And if we look at uh, consumer real income, so adjusted for inflation per capita, that's trending higher. So that means, you know, consumers are actually earning more uh, beyond inflation. And, and that trend has continued from, from prior to COVID, right? So we're actually seeing this very consistent trend upward. Income supports spending. And we know what consumers like to do when they receive income, they like to spend it, right? The stock market's going higher. Consumers have confidence about their incomes, which means they're saving less and less of their money, which which we're also seeing. You know, the savings rate is positive, but it but it has declined. Consumers are spending more. And, and we look at where consumers are spending money. Like I said, at the top, it's kind of on these discretionary categories, hotels, you know, restaurants, recreational goods and services, uh, you know, and like these are not areas that consumers typically increase their spending when the economy is poor. And then, you know, lastly, if you look at business spending and some of the components there, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we've seen a, a bit of a slowdown in growth of spending on stuff like machinery and equipment, but on, on items like, you know, structures like new factories or, um, 
um, in, intangible uh, property rights and intangible assets, their their spending is actually still growing, right? And it's growing at, at quite a healthy clip. So, you know, everything that we see from the economy is it's surely not gangbusters like it was in in, in twenty twenty one, right? But I think it's it's certainly pretty strong compared to what you would think, considering where monetary policy is, um, and, and still right at or above trend growth, which I think is it, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and, and I know we kind of alluded to it earlier, but I think now is a great time to kind of talk about unemployment with the overall economy. Yeah. So, um, unemployment is not at a 50 year high. I hope that's like very clear. So like the unemployment rate right now is at 3.9%. Um, but I think it's like really important for us. Let's, let's like peel back this onion a little bit and, and talk about like what goes into this measure. Cause it, cause it's, it's criticized quite a bit, right? So to, to be counted as employed, in this in this survey, they go around and they and they call like over sixty thousand households and they and they have this survey, and they ask a question: Have you worked for pay for at least an hour during the last week? If they say yes for at least an hour for pay, then you're employed. You are counted as you have a job in that survey. If you say no, I have not worked for at least an hour for pay, they ask you a second question: Were you looking for work in the in the previous four weeks? If you say no then you're not counted as unemployed. You're only counted as unemployed in this measure if you don't have a job and you are actively seeking employment, right? As in applying for jobs. And so a lot of people will say, well, you know, there's some people that are, are trying to get jobs, uh, but they, they stopped looking for jobs. And now they, since they stopped looking, they're not counted as unemployed, but really they still are, right? And 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 those people, it's it's true. They're not included in that unemployment rate. So what we use is a rate that that includes some of those other factors, right? That that looks at okay, what about the people that uh, that they call them marginally displaced, discouraged workers, workers that don't have a job, looked for a job at some point in the past year, but stopped looking in the past four weeks because they just straight up think there are no jobs for me, right? So so we include those in there, right? Because maybe those should be counted. There's also some people that are counted as employed because they worked for at least one hour, but they're working part time and wish they worked full time. Well, that's pretty important, too, if we're assessing the health of the economy, right? Is the economy healthy enough to sustain employment on a full-time basis for, for a lot of people? Or are there more and more people that are working part-time for involuntary reasons? They'd rather work full-time. And so when you, when, you, when you add in some of those measures to the traditional unemployment rate, you get something called the U6 unemployment rate. And this right now is not at 3.9% like uh, the U3 unemployment rate, the headline unemployment rate. It's actually at 7.4%. However... This is also not a 50-year high, and this is actually at, at some of the lowest rates that it's been for a while. Uh, and usually when this rate is below 8%, that's kind of commensurate with the headline unemployment rate being below 4%, and that, that's kind of a level that is about a, as low as it gets. That kind of signifies full employment. And to your point, when we look at these measures, not only are they extremely low, and they're low on an absolute basis, they're low on a relative basis to prior periods, but they've been low for a really, really long time. I actually checked before this and looked at the, the longest duration that the U6 unemployment rate has been below 8%, and it's 34 months back in the, uh, back in the early th 2000s, late 90s or early 2000s, 34 months. Right now we're at 30, that we've gone below 8%, and for a while there we were below 7%. So... Employment actually remains really, really healthy. It remains healthy even when you include all those other people that are typically excluded from the headline rate. Um, and I think, you know, even though it's rare for unemployment to stay so low for so long, maybe this time is different. Yeah, and I think I think you brought a lot of really good points there. I think people try to, they look at the unemployment rate and say, hey, this isn't counting me or my friend or this situation because... Well, however they count it and just kind of explained how it's it's measured there it, it doesn't include this person or that person but i think the kind of big thing to recognize there is we're looking at this at a full country's level and so the whole entire country and trying to measure the success of the economy and the health of the economy based off of this measure and so um, no statistic really is going to be perfect in how it's measuring its data. I think the most important thing kind of looking across most metrics in finance is looking at the trend and saying, okay, how is this compared to in the past? A number just in obscurity, just when you, you threw out that U6 number, 7.4%. Um, 
I have no idea if that's high, if that's low, if that's healthy, if that's good. Uh, but when you kind of look at the trend, okay, this has been at the lowest level we've seen for the last 30 months, kind of, I'm guessing 30 months dates back to probably like March, 2020, somewhere around then. 30 months below eight. So that's not even measuring. 30 months below feet. eight. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm still guessing that still would get us right back to like COVID though, when it was a button. It's right? basically like right there at COVID when we reopened and, you know, 2021 uh, at, at some point. Yeah. But like, you know, it's, it's typically what we see is unemployment falls and it falls for a while and then it reaches that low level and then it spikes again, because that's right when we have another recession and what we've seen this time. And even though we've expected that internally, uh, that, that broad based weakness really hasn't materialized and unemployment has stayed, you know, really low. So um, you know, I think that's that's good for a lot of different reasons. And, and to your point, it's not that we're trying to find a perfect measure, but we are trying to understand what these measures tell us, understand what they don't tell us, and and then take that for what it's worth, right? And and to your point, we're looking at the trend and we're looking at the level. Uh, and both of those, I think, for unemployment and frankly for inflation, um, are, are pretty good. Yeah, and and I think uh, like the. The ultimate question that everyone always has is, okay, what's next? What are we, what are we going to see going forward? Um, and I think it's really dependent on how healthy these levels stay uh, and what happens to inflation. Because that's ultimately what the Federal Reserve is looking at, the health of our economy uh, and how high inflation is. is Price it? stability and full employment, as they would say. Exactly, exactly. They're two two parameters of, of what their their major are, are, are really looking at. Uh, and so if inflation starts to spike back up out of this 3% range up to four or five, um, that might lead to, to interest rates going back up. Um, this isn't really expected. Um, no, no economists are, are really predicting this kind of across the board, but that is technically a possibility. Um, what I think is more widely consensus uh, in terms of the view is that we'll either stay in this range or, or start to hopefully trend downward uh, and either something in the economy breaks or more likely now is, is kind of seeming that, okay, the Federal Reserve is just going to have more room to bring this interest rate down as uh, kind of this rate gets more uh, inundated into to the market and it becomes kind of more used to it uh, and, and able to have that ability to bring rates down without necessarily spiking inflation back up. Um, am I kind of right? I- yeah, no, I, th- I think you're right. Like, so it's it's interesting. I, I've asked some people, they, they've said like, you know, if, if the Fed cuts rates too early, it's going to spur a lot of additional inflation. But I always ask, them, I say, well, haven't we been talking about how the economy is not as sensitive to interest rate changes as we thought it was? I mean, the Fed hiked interest rates from zero to five and a half percent, and we're still talking about how houses are still being built, businesses are still spending money, consumers still have jobs and are spending money. So why why are we expecting a cut in rates to really cause this surge in inflation? Like I, I think that's kind of counterintuitive based on you know the premise of the economy is more resilient to higher rates. Um, you know, I, I don't know, and I also think like there, there's this think about, you know, think about inflation. Most of inflation that we're experiencing right now, especially in the CPI index, is from shelter, is, is from shelter prices and housing prices. Well, how do you fix high housing pl- prices because of supply shortages? Well, you build more houses. Well, what, what makes it tougher and more expensive to build more houses? Higher interest rates. So if the Fed lowered interest rates, would it incentivize additional building of houses and maybe fix some of the problem that's causing some of this inflation? I, you know, I think there's something to be said there. You know, I, I really think so. Yeah, no, that's that, that's really interesting um, when you kind of put it like that. But um, I know we've kind of gone through through a lot. Uh, we, we we talked about the updates and in, in sort of what we've seen in in the market. Um, started off with thinking about like the S and P was was a really hot start to the year. We had this pullback in April as inflation came out a little bit hotter than expectations. Uh, saw like a 5% pullback in, in the S&P 500. And now we're back to, to all-time highs. And um, this has really been a, a year of a lot of all-time highs. Mm. Uh, and it's been a, a year of, of a really strong economy. So hopefully we continue to, to see that. Um, the, the markets continue to churn uh, and, and we keep trending in that direction. 
Yeah, I agree. I think you know we've hit over 20 new all-time highs. Uh, so the S&P is up this year. And, you know, I think what's interesting is when we when we hit new all-time highs, it's usually because whatever we were worried about that caused the drawdown uh, has has passed, right? And and now we realize that it's either corrected itself or we were, um, you know, a, a little too exaggerated on the downside, right? Overreacted. And so what typically happens is, you know, the natural direction for stocks, I mean, these are businesses that earn money, that accrue income for their shareholders. The natural direction is is up, you know, and as long as there's something that's not holding that back and, and we're in a normal economic period, that's where you expect stocks to go. And that's why new all-time highs typically continue on to, to lead to additional new all-time highs. And, you know, something I would point out before we, before we sign off is we had this 5% pullback in April. And pullbacks always suck because... You you know they're coming. The average pullback for the S and P five hundred any given year is fourteen percent, even though the S and P finishes higher seventy five percent of the time in those calendar years, right? So we know pullbacks happen. They happen every year, even in good years for the stock market, uh, but they always happen for some reason that seems like a legitimate reason to sell stocks. I mean that's why stocks ultimately get sold and and they sell off. And I think what's interesting about this recent pullback is. It was as scary as all the others with so many people going for the exits and, and clambering for the exits really quickly, but it only ended up being a 5% pullback. And we have so many clients that, that talk to us about, you know, 15% pullback and, and how, how tough that was and a 20%, 25% pullback and how tough those can be. And they say, you know, we, we, we just kind of find a way to, to avoid this. And I think what's really tough about that is how do you know the 5% pullback is going to turn into that? You know, I think over the history of the S and P, we've had you know over sixty five percent pullbacks that didn't end up being uh, anything more than that, right? And it was just a five percent pullback. So I think that's a that's kind of a good lesson, right? The, the people that suck it out, sometimes that's what happens, you know. And then for other people that get scared and sell out, well, you just sold out when it only went down five percent, and now it's right back at all time highs. What do we prefer to do? Just don't play that game. You know there's going to be a pullback. Be able to stomach that volatility. And if stocks really do get cheap uh, and they have to rebound, then buy more. Rebalance. And that's what we do. Exactly. And I, I, I love this graph. We'll, we'll pull it up here um, if you're you're watching on the YouTube. Uh, if if you're just listening, uh, we'll, we can kind of describe it here. But it's basically what, what just, Jeff just outlined. Um, but it's, it's showing all the, the pullbacks. Uh, in the market, uh, in the S and P 500, uh, or, or the calendar year returns, uh, dating back to, to the eighties and showing that an average entry year drop of 14%, um, yet annual returns are positive in 33 to 44 years. And so the red dot on each of these is, um, kind of the, the biggest pullback that we had in that year. And so this year it's, it's 5%. Um, but last year, calendar year 2023, uh, was was a ten percent down. Yet at the end of the year, we ended up up twenty four percent. And so um, we we definitely agree that that being able to um, ride the storm per se is is advantageous uh, through, throughout. And not trying to to time the market is is definitely a, a huge proponent to to success with investing. Um, but I think we we covered a lot and and. Appreciate your time on on the podcast, Jeff. Uh, hopefully, I'm I'm not falling in love with an open AI platform by the next time we meet, and we're we're good to oh, go. Man, you better be careful out there, Arish. Uh, no, they took off the Scarlett Johansson voice. So I think I'm I think I'm good. There are a lot of <laughs> capable, available women out there, Arish. Okay, just hold on to hope. All righty, uh, all right, signing off. All information provided by this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not constitute investment, legal, or tax advice. It is not an offer to buy or sell any security or any insurance product. This is not an endorsement of any third party or such third party's views. The information contained herein has been obtained from sources we believe to be reliable and is not guaranteed as to its accuracy or completeness. Whenever there are references to third-party content, this information is intended to provide additional perspective and should not be construed as an endorsement of any services, products, guidance, individuals, or points of view outside of Benedetti Gusser & Associates and Beam Wealth Advisors. All examples are hypothetical and for illustrative purposes only. Benedetti Gusser & Associates and Beam Wealth Advisors do not offer tax or legal advice. Interested parties are strongly encouraged to seek advice from qualified tax and or legal experts regarding the best options for your particular circumstances.